Julie Cooper is a senior lecturer uh, in the political science department at Tel Aviv University. Her research interests include the history of political theory, early modern political theory, especially Hobbes and Spinoza, secularism and secularization, Jewish political thought and modern Jewish thought. She is the author of Secular Powers, Humility in Modern Political Thought, 2013. Her work has appeared in journals including Review of Politics, the Historical Journal of Political Theory, and Jewish Quarterly Review. She is currently working on a book project tentatively entitled Politics Without Sovereignty, Exile, State, and Territory in Jewish Thought, that examines modern attempts to reimagine and rehabilitate Judaism, national and political dimensions. So, um, okay, so I study Jewish politics, so I'm going to try to read this story as an episode within Jewish politics and try to draw out what I see as the implications of this story for Jewish politics, specifically in the present. Um, because as I see it, Jim makes a, cr a critical contribution uh, to those of us who are trying to wrestle with contemporary Jewish political predicaments, in particular because he powerfully illustrates the vexed place of the nation state in 20th century Jewish politics. On the one hand, Jim challenges teleological narratives that depict Zionism as a movement that, from the moment of its very inception, was single-minded in pursuit of a sovereign Jewish state. Against this view, Jim returns us to a period in which professed Zionists devoted much of their political energy to securing protection for diaspora Jews through minority rights treaties and also to the creation of international legal regimes. Yet, as Jim demonstrates, Lemkin and Lauderpack gradually abandoned what Jim calls the blended model of individual and group rights, that they eventually ended up abandoning, or at least weakening, the blended model that had informed their Zionist activism as they sought to accommodate their legal vision to the dominant logic of the international state system post-1948, that logic being the logic of sovereignty, right? So I'm thinking about how uh, Jim mentioned that post-48, uh, both Lemkin and Waterpack have to wrestle with the status character of international human rights uh, uh, in that historical period. In short, Jim simultaneously exposes the limitations that the sovereign frame places on our political thinking while reminding us how hard it is to dispense with this frame, this frame again being the sovereign frame, or even to loosen its constraints. Jim's crucial contribution to contemporary Jewish politics turns on this double-edged reminder. The nation state is not a destiny. It does not represent the inevitable culmination of the Jewish quest for self-determination. Yet, as the history of the 20th century attests, Jewish thinkers have found it difficult to mount a convincing challenge to the nation state and its hegemony. So the question is, why is this double-edged reminder crucial for Jewish political thinkers in the present? To riff on a question that Jim himself poses, why is this the past that we need now? I think it's the past that we need now because we are now living through a period that may portend the end of the nation state phase within the history of Jewish nationalism. To explain what I mean by this somewhat rash prediction, I must embark on a brief historical excursus. As Jim reminds us, the period immediately following World War I was one of fierce debate regarding both the geographical location of the Jewish national project, Europe versus Palestine, or even elsewhere in the world, um, and it was also a period of fierce debate regarding the ideal political model, sovereign state versus local autonomy. Indeed, the question of regime remained a live debate early uh, into the early 1940s, pitting partisans of the nation state against proponents of local autonomy, federalism and confederalism, and binationalism. In this period, what Jim calls the blended model was neither a curiosity nor a contradiction in terms. After World War II, however, state-centered models of politics, liberalism in the Anglo-American diaspora and the nation-state in Israel, emerged as the default political options given modern Jewish history. In this period, the post-war period, post-World War II, it was commonplace to insist that non-sovereign visions for Jewish politics, such as the autonomism of Simon Dubna, had been decisively refuted by history. As Jim so powerfully demonstrates, the ascendance of the nation-state frame placed significant constraints on the Jewish political imagination. Suddenly, terms like autonomy, federalism, and binationalism were struck from the political lexicon. This ideological erasure helped to entrench what Jim calls mental binaries, 
such as cosmopolitanism versus tribalism, sovereignty versus transnationalism. The ideological configurations of the post-World War II period largely revolved around liberal individualism, a universalist vision, and statist Zionism, which we think of as a particularist vision, um, and we really lacked the resources for imagining things otherwise. So that's the post-World War II period. Now, where are we today? Jumping forward. Um, with the death of the Oslo process and the rise of ethno-national populism, we are seeing a fundamental realignment of these post-World War II ideological configurations. The Oslo Accords arguably constituted the consummate expression of the state-centered approach to Jewish politics. The logic that animated the Oslo process was the logic of the nation-state. To enfranchise minorities, partisans of the nation-state would carve up the world so as to better align the borders of states with the borders of nations. In the local context, that meant the two-state solution and the slogan, two states for two peoples. Space constraints prevent me from expatiating upon the causes for Oslo's demise. I will merely note that the dominant trends within Israeli politics post-Oslo point to a progressive uncoupling of nation and state. Here I'm thinking of many, many phenomena, but one of them uh, uh, would be the vocal and increasingly mainstream calls to extend Israeli sovereignty over the West Bank. To preserve Jewish hegemony in the land of Israel, many Israeli Jews are willing to extend the state's jurisdiction over populations that they exclude from the nation, on the condition that Palestinians remain disenfranchised or, at best, second-class citizens. Thus, on my reading, and this is an admittedly counterintuitive reading, the passage of the so-called nation-state law is a symptom of the nation-state's fragility rather than evidence of its conclusive victory. The law's name is a misnomer, for there's a fundamental difference between a nation-state and the one-state solutions which are proposed by many of the law's supporters. The one state of the one state solution is not a nation state, it is either a civil state or an apartheid state. In retrospect, I wager, the nation state law may come to symbolize the moment in which the nation state began to lose its veneer of obviousness, subject to increasing challenge from competing visions for Jewish politics, some of them democratic, but many of them blatantly undemocratic. How can the past that Jew has retrieved help us to navigate this perilous moment? To challenge the dominant trends within Jewish politics, I would argue, we need to combat the very mental binaries that have prevented Jew scholars from appreciating the history of human rights. Too often, however, the Jewish left, especially in America, but not just in America, remains trapped within the prevailing oppositions, the universalism, particularism, opposition. The chauvinist character of contemporary Jewish nationalisms has led many liberal and progressive Jews to conclude that they must reject nationalism altogether. Today, the most prominent Jewish democratic alternatives to state-centered Zionism are avowedly universalist. The pressing task, according to these thinkers, is to rescue so-called Jewish ethics from the particularist taint by disabusing Jews of national and territorial attachments. Trapped within received binaries, these thinkers exhibit an anti-political tendency reminiscent of certain human rights discourses. Once we loosen the binaries, however, the pressing task is not to dissolve or domesticate particular attachments, but to take up the challenge of what Jim calls reordering the world into political communities. Expanding the political imagination is especially urgent when the nation state appears to be losing its grip on the Jewish political imagination. If we analyze current political dynamics through the lens of Jim's blended model, we can see that the demise of the Jewish nation state need not signal the end of Zionism or of Jewish nationalism more generally. As the nation state loses its default status, we can hope for the revival of an old, new political insight. There is more than one way to realize the right to Jewish self-determination. As old ideological configurations crumble, we may be able to imagine more just forms of self-determination, forms which are more capacious than the nation state. If Jim's story allows us to read our contemporary predicament as one chapter in an ongoing debate about the question of regime, which regime will allow Jews to achieve the right to self-determination, I think Jim's story also contains an important caution for those who would advocate non-sovereign visions for contemporary Jewish politics. For as Jim documents, it is difficult to uphold and implement the blended model when the sovereign state reigns as the dominant mode of political organization. The nation state may be weaker today than it was in 1948, but the model remains tenacious as attested by events like Brexit and figures like Trump. Any serious attempt to envision non-sovereign modes of Jewish politics must reckon with these formidable difficulties. In the Jewish context, the difficulties stem not only from the prevailing logics of the international order, 
but also from the often provisional nature of non-sovereign strands within Jewish thought. In some, it is not enough to gesture toward ethically compelling roads not taken. As Jim reminds us, if we are serious about changing the direction of contemporary Jewish politics, we also have to gauge the obstacles that stood in the way of their realization the first time around. To exploit the democratic potential latent in this admittedly frightening historical and political moment, we need a sober assessment of the challenges confronting projects to fundamentally reshape the legal and political imagination. Thanks.